ok. É... Professor Kazo just uh, has joined us. I don't know if. Hello. I'm going to send him a message. Ah, yeah, okay. He's uh, well, something like Zoom, I think, the system. Okay. So let's wait. And I'm going first to introduce you. And then, as I said, uh, everyone has some, well, time to make a statement or put his ideas on. And we're going to discuss it. And I think people are going to uh, uh, join us or whatsoever. And we have about 45 minutes. That is at uh, 11 o'clock uh, Central European summertime. Uh, we are going to finish. Or a little bit later. I mean, it, it depends if we have something more uh, to say. Uh, I, for my part, I have <laughs> all the past 11, I have my seminar, so <laughs> I, I should leave then. So about 20 minutes, uh, 20 past okay. 11 or so. So I'm going to stop it now and then. Okay. But the, the, a lot of time is until 11 o'clock, so 45 minutes. And I don't know who is, uh, I mean, as I said, I think the, the world is, is looking at us or something like that. Or the world... Uh, who paid 159 euros or so to, to join us. <laughs> <laughs> I see a very reasonable line of skepticism <laughs> around the role of oh, no, it's, it's, it's For me, just new. I mean, it's, it's I kind of endorse it. <laughs> it's okay. Well, why not? I mean, uh, you know that in... Uh, uh, psychotherapy. There is one idea that uh, the, 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 the the patients have to pay for for the therapies, and therefore there are people who say that uh, this should not covered by the um, public um, uh, uh, health uh, organizations, something like this, because the people have to work for this. So it's good. I mean, why not? So so let's so now four minutes. We see, and I don't know if uh, Anita is uh, watching this or so. As I said, it's the first time I joined such a um, uh, thing, so an event. Professor Kongs, hello in Qatar. Are you in Qatar? Uh, I'm actually in Virginia now. Oh, yeah, uh, Virginia. okay. Yeah, I travel. Uh, to, we spend the summers in Virginia. Weather's, see. A, bit, weather's a bit nicer. Uh, okay, I understand. Yeah, and uh, so there is a something like a dependence or something like a department in of your university in Qatar. So in, uh, mm -hmm. something like this. Right. Yeah, Georgetown University set up a campus uh, back in 2005, I think. So uh -huh. just a, a branch of the School of Foreign Service. Actually, there's there's quite a number of American universities over there at Education City, uh, okay. Virginia Tech and Texas A&M, Northwestern, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Quite a number over there. And uh, uh, they are, uh, so say, so meant by people from the, from the states, or do they have also local... Um, it's almost uh, exclusively... Oh, the, the, staff are, <laughs> the staff are international. Uh, the students are mostly uh, mostly local and from the region. <laughs> so. uh, yeah, I mean, we do have some American professors, but they're not in the they're not in the majority. I see. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's no. a very international staff. Okay, that's good. <coughs> and uh, you just have a. Uh... And enough students to put it so. Oh yes. yes, they are coming from the region and from abroad, or so. Right, right. And this is uh, more or less so. They obtain also uh, degrees that are to say so from the mother university. So yeah, the degrees just say Georgetown University on them. It doesn't specify mm -hmm. that it's from the, the Qatar campus. It's the so, same. Yeah. It's the same curriculum. Uh, same there curriculum. is on main campus. 
And is there also something like, uh, say, uh, research facilities? I mean, okay, in humanities, it's not so mm-hmm. critical, but in, uh, or do you offer also, say, natural sciences or only humanities? We don't really have, uh, we don't really have much in the sciences uh, over there. Um, mm-hmm. It's, it's mostly, we mostly focus on the humanities. Uh, mm-hmm. Texas A&M is an engineering school, and so they, they do more in, in the sciences, uh, research in the sciences. But we, we're mostly humanities and social sciences. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we were set up as the branch of the School of Foreign Service, and, and the students on main campus always joke that SFS stands for safe from science. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. But... Uh... Okay, no, Qatar, Qatar is Qatar. Qatar is not the Emirates. Okay, yeah. Somehow. Right, right. Okay, so I'm not going Although we're, we're adjacent, you can actually, well, you used to be able to drive from Qatar to the Emirates. You have to drive through Saudi Arabia a little bit. And we, we actually did that once, which turned out mm. not to be fun. <laughs> was, we didn't do it a second time. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> okay, so there is a message from someone. Let me see what's happening. Uh. Okay. So let's, uh, I think, uh, start. So uh, welcome to this uh, panel uh, on this uh, Horace's uh, meeting, uh, 2022. And uh, uh, the topic of our panel is uh, lessons from the pandemic on philosophy. <clears throat> First, um, I'm going to, uh, agree to, uh, to greet our two uh, visitors here. Uh, oh, there are more. Uh, Jill Marden, Benda Hofmeier, and uh, Cleve Kalo. Hello. So I'm going to introduce now the members of the panel. Uh, one member is missing. Perhaps uh, she will join us later or not. I, I didn't have any contact with her. Is this is um, I'm going to introduce for the uh, Professor Debbie Saha from the University uh, of. Uh, uh, North Bengal, no, uh, from the uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in India. Okay, she's uh, uh, not with us, but I'm going to introduce you in alphabetical order. So first we have uh, Pier Giorgio Donatelli, who is Professor of Moral Philosophy at the uh, Sapienza University in Rome, and he is also the head of the Department of Philosophy. Well, okay, he has... Uh, uh, he's the author for several publications, and I'm going just... Uh, to cite uh, uh, a history of ethics, uh, Ethica, in uh, t- uh, 2015, a book the, uh, of the, uh, on the idea of uh, human life, uh, Mania Dead Woman, uh, with Vrin, Vrin or, uh, 2015, and recently a book about the politics of human life, Rethinking Subjectivity at Rontlitz, um in uh, 2021, and he's also the editor of the uh, Italian journal Iride. Iride something like that. Uh, the next on my list is uh, Professor Jeremy Combs, who is Associate Professor of Philosophy at the Georgetown University in uh, the Qatar campus. He received his uh, PhD uh, at the Georgetown University in 1998. His uh, areas of research and teaching are epistemology, Ethical Theory, Philosophy of Religion, Philosophy of Mind, Applied Ethics, and Applied Ethics. And I am going to mention two publications of him, to uh, The Metaphysics of Practice, uh, Writings from Wilfred Sellers uh, on Action, Community, and Obligation, that was co-edited with um, Kyle Ferguson, which is obviously in, 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 in press or in preparation. And another publication is Ethics, uh, Practical Reasoning Agency, Wilfred Sellers, Practical Philosophy. It's a volume that he has co-edited with uh, Ronald Löffler. So the next is uh, Professor Jean-Christophe Merle, uh, who is a professor at the University of uh, Fechter in Germany and uh, also honorary professor at the University of uh, Saarland in Saarbrücken. And in 2013, had also, he, had also, um, was, he was visiting professor at the University of Iceland. His uh, main fields of uh, work or research are philosophy uh, of law and uh, political philosophy, also uh, in, in uh, German idealism, 
he is, uh, uh, I think, directing a research group, Direito uh, Rajao Pratica, uh, Pratica uh, that is uh, in, with, uh, obviously with a uh, Brazilian university, I think in Belo Horizonte, obviously, yes. And uh, about his uh, publications, um, there's a monography about uh, um, uh, uh, Strafnos Respect for the Menschenwürde, which means uh, punishing um, out of uh, respect for the, uh, the human dignity in, uh, with uh, De Grauter in Berlin. In English, it was published under the title German Idealism and the, Co and the Concept of Punishment uh, with the Cambridge University Press. And uh, I have another book, um, uh, Justice et Progress, in, uh, in French, uh, that was published in, in Paris, uh, Presse Universitaire de France. And he uh, has also quoted a um, uh, volume with, um, with articles, Spheres of Global Justice, uh, uh, with Okay, now, and, uh, okay, last but not least is uh, Stefan Lorenzogna who is also in Italy. He's chair of the Department of History at Humanities and professor of philosophy at the uh, John Cabot uh, University in Rome. And he's director and co-founder of the Young Humanism Network and also a fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technolog uh, Technologies and also a fellow at the it says EVA Institute for the Humanities in EVA. Uh, EVA. EVA in Souls. EVA. Yeah. Like this, okay. Sorry <laughs> for the misspelling. Uh, in Seoul, and also a uh, visiting fellow at the uh, Friedrich University, uh, Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, around the corner here in Leipzig. He has also uh, published uh, several uh, books. Uh, I just mentioned, uh, mentioned Metaphysics Without Truth, uh, 2007, uh, Menschen Würde nach Nietzsche, uh, 2010, uh, Transhumanismus. Uh, this is in German, Schöne neue Mensch, Brave New Human, something like that, yeah. Übermensch, very interesting, the 2019. Perhaps I'm going to read this, you know. And on yeah. humanism, which is, I think, quite interesting. Uh, Penn State University 2020. And also, we also have uh, Cyborgs and also Philosophy of Human Art, which are the, the most recent uh, books of him. And he is also editor in chief and founded editor of the journal, uh, journal of Posthuman Studies, which is published uh, with Penn State University since 2017. So, and my name in uh, my name is Nikos Psaros. I am um, here professor and uh, well docent of uh, philosophy at the University of Leipzig uh, since uh, 1998 when I came to Leipzig with a fellowship. Um, I. Absolutely interesting. I, the time before, I, I was chemist. I studied chemistry and philosophy. So my specializations are philosophy of science, philosophy of nature, uh, social ontology, and uh, history of science. So, and I am the chair of this panel. So, uh, for our uh, visitors, uh, again, I'm uh, greeting and uh, welcome you to our panel. I hope that uh, some other people are going to join us uh, sometime. So we are going to discuss, uh, well, they say the impact uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, current pandemic from a philosophical point of view. Uh, the title was Lessons uh, on Philosophy, Lessons from the Pandemic. And um, there are some points of discussion that have been, uh, have been suggested. Uh, by uh, the organizers of, uh, of this conference. Uh, so one question is, or oh, say, let me put it so, is there a new form of uh, governance uh, necessary uh, um, in view of this uh, global uh, pandemic? Okay, it's a clear one, sorry. Uh, that somehow determines uh, or has the right to, to declare, uh, uh, to say so something like a general uh, state of, uh, of illness, I think. Yeah, something like this, like a general state of emergency, you know, like uh, Carl Schmidt in the state, uh, the power lies with uh, who has <laughs> the, the right to declare the state of emergency, something like that. Yeah. So 
is uh, to say so uh, uh, a way of uh, legitimizing a new f- form of governance as can declare such states of of, of, of emergency with regard to to such uh, pandemics, uh, such events that are more or less natural disasters, and not uh, you know so not uh, not uh, warlike situations, but uh, um, so and. Uh, And uh, how can we, uh, to say so, uh, set up a system of welfare that is uh, uh, that supports this idea and is also uh, efficient and just? I think that is the, the main question. So the idea, as I understood it, is uh, well, uh, well, how can we legitimize uh, philosophically this, uh, those all these measures that have restricted travel and uh, personal freedom and uh, Um, more or less, okay. In Europe, it was perhaps not severe. In some parts of the world, less, uh, even less severe than in Europe, for example, in the States or so. But in other parts of the world, it was very, very, very severe, and it's still. I mean, like in China or so, no, where the people are not even allowed to to leave their their houses or you know, I mean, uh, or the, the residential buildings or so, okay. And so that they have a problem even to to get food. Okay, because if in one uh, skyscraper lives about 500 people or so, and they have only one entrance and the food is delivered downstairs, and the people have to come from the I don't know 60th floor to the ground uh, basement to the to the basement uh, to the ground floor to to, to pick up, the, it's, uh, they have a lot of problems with that. And another problem that I perhaps would like, to, if you if you agree, I mean you you are free uh, to 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 provide your own ideas to this. Is uh, what's about this uh, attitude of, of uh, the scientists? I mean, I mean the the um, the, the, the uh, doctors, uh, the medical people, uh, and also some biologists and virologists, and so who appeared in the media <clears throat> and acted something like uh, prophets of disaster. So I mean, they declared that the world is going down, or I don't know what, or said us uh, that uh, this will have this will end then and then, or never and whatsoever. So, uh, so that's about the the concept of uh, uh, or the relationship between uh, scientific prognosis and uh, uh, this kind of uh, of uh, of appearing in the public that uh, that appears in the form of a prophecy, more or less, which means that it's uh, the prognosis of an event that somehow cannot be uh, uh, given a sufficient reason for this. Uh, uh, a part of the fact that uh, the, the person who is uh, prophesying says, "Okay, I'm the scientist, and just trust me; it will happen this in this way." So this is another problem. So okay, I'm opening now the discussion, and um, I don't know. Right, perhaps we should, perhaps in uh, so in alphabetical order, uh, have a statement of you. So uh, Pier Giorgio, you are the D. So. Wonderful, thank you. How how long would you like us to talk? Just a few minutes, or? Yeah. Well, as I said, we have uh, 45 to 50 minutes, so I think so. Five Whatever. minutes is okay, so something like that. So thank you to Nikos, thank you for, to Professor Psaros. It's uh, nice being with you today in this um, strange environment, but we are accustomed to it. <laughs> so maybe it's only us or millions of people from different planets listening to us. So I only have, made, I have an idea that I thought... Uh, of giving you this morning. So the idea, this has been written actually uh, by a few people, uh, that we can try to um, think of the pandemic as an experiment in the sense in which uh, John Stuart Mill and also Dewey uh, thought that individual and social choices in life can be taken as experiments that allow you to understand what is more functional in order to realize human happiness. So if we take uh, the pandemic as an experiment, pandemic experiment, so I don't want to sound too optimistic, but <laughs> I will definitely sound op- optimistic, so I'm sorry about that. I think uh, it can teach us lessons that defend a kind of uh, project, uh, we can call it enlightenment, a democratic project, uh, which is also under attack. It is now in this war, and it was also during the pa- pandemic. And so I think we, sh- I want to defend that. I think philosophy can do it with with its own instruments. And then, as you said before, philosophy, of course, uh, is, I mean, as a teeny tiny place, and then history goes on with other methods. So very quickly, um, if we if we think of the pandemic, especially the first uh, two years, uh, um, humanity was taken by surprise, but the response was... Uh, 
completely, I mean, astonishing with, and, and re realizing outstanding results. So very briefly, the virus was sequenced. Uh, it was put in this Gizade Internet uh, Initiative, so open to everybody. And then in 10 months, uh, Pfizer submitted the vaccine and then quick and then other and then quickly approvals from national regulatory agencies in Europe as well, quickly followed. And then billions of doses were administered worldwide and are. So this is super quickly. So uh, this is a super success. Then speaking of another issue, Transnational political collaboration is the weaker side. I'm very sorry that our colleague from India is not here with us today. Uh, still, I think that we should consider that communication about, among uh, scholars and, and scientists was open, possible, information were exchanged, and basically, uh, and basically the planet was not divided up behind the iron curtains. So, I mean, science was able to communicate. So this is also something new and completely important. And also media and the internet basically worked out. And so it was possible to have a dissemination of information about the pandemic. They reached the world population in real time. Uh, so I believe that the major failures, important failures, must be placed within a framework of a response based on the use of scientific knowledge of human rationality and political cooperation. This, I think, was something very much clear. So the response to the pandemic has also highlighted something else. I'm following here, if you notice that I have in front of me, also a synergy, which is also something that we are accustomed, but it's also very recent, between different branches of science, like medicine, digital technologies, artificial intelligence, and also ethics. For example, I only recall, I, I kind of work also in biology, I only recall the genetic research had raised the considerable doubts, and on this occasion, even the Vatican, who is all, always very conservative on these issues, approve vaccine research and production conducted on cell lines derived from aborted fetuses. So this is also something of great importance. Uh, and the same vaccines had been at the center of campaigns aimed at discrediting the confidence in them. And on this occasion, these anti-scientific movements, significantly present as they were in our nations, were not able at all to stop research and production of vaccines. So this is also something important. So first part of the picture is that there was a synergy uh, between science, technology, social and ethical concerns, which is a lesson, in my view, in favor of the Enlightenment project based on the value of rationality and human cooperation. Now, if you look at the failures, also something I think important uh, comes out. Obviously, uh, experts knew about the risk. Even important public figures like Bill Gates uh, had dedicated major initiatives uh, to the pandemic risk, but this knowledge and awareness uh, did not, as it were, trickle down to the collective consciousness and also political governments of nations. Okay, still, uh, this unpreparedness of humanity, how can we explain it? So there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, um, I mean, um, also fashionable way of explaining it in terms of a kind of a constitutive limitation of the human brain and psychology due to evolutionary, I mean, reasons. So, for example, John Julian Sabolesco and many people. And uh, this is a kind of explaining according to which actually humanity is not really uh, able to face these kind of risks. I don't kind of, I mean, of course, we need to be, uh, need to keep in mind the limitation of human psychology that emerge in light of evolutionary considerations, yet uh, I believe uh, we should not over overlook at all explanations given in cultural and political terms. So, for example, China, because of the political system, hid data early in the pandemic coherently with its uh, political structure and the total lack of transparency uh, had obviously major negative consequences. We had a gigantic risk in 86 with Chernobyl, and uh, I mean, there's a wonderful TV series on this. And basically, it was a matter of contingency that continental Europe wasn't invaded by and polluted by, by, by nuclear, uh, by, by the nuclear fallout. Uh, but also, when the, and I stop here, I don't want to talk too much, uh, Nikos. Uh, once the pandemic broke out, again, we can see the political differences. And for example, within democratic nations, uh, uh, 
populist or in the lack of a better word, leaders like Trump, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Modi in India, uh, undermine the problem, criticize expert committees, foster misinformation, weaken the trust in scientific community, and that resulted in more deaths, in more chaos, in more, I mean, society actually being more critical. So I think that the ethical and political structure of society is crucial. And so also in this sense, uh, the pandemic experiment, if you can use uh, this uh, notion, uh, can tell us something about uh, the, the importance of putting together, as I said, uh, uh, also looking at the failures and, and, and the successes, putting together, as I said, science, uh, technology, ethics, uh, and political Uh, cooperation. So maybe I can stop here and then I can say something um, more. So I don't want to sound too optimistic, but uh, we need to see this. Also, let me end with this. Because we are accustomed, especially as philosophers and also in the social sciences, with uh, very critical accounts of the present state of uh, society. So we are accustomed, you know, social social sciences are, are typically very critical, and so everything is like close to the collapse, uh, and we, we have never been worse than, than now. So I don't want to be too much Whiggish, but I think a kind of argument along Steven Pinker's optimism, which I don't endorse completely, should be, at a certain okay. extent, defended. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Kohn, please. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Nikos, and, and Pier Giorgio, for... for I'm, going to pick up a little bit on the I want to pick up on the themes of the of the panel and also uh maybe pick up on, on some of the themes of our of our previous speaker uh concerning what what are the philosophical lessons that society can actually learn from the pandemic. Uh I, I think most importantly society needs to remember what it is that makes humanity so successful as a species in the first place, which is something that uh we seem to have lost sight of during the pandemic. Uh, I, I think a lot of people have the idea that humans are so successful as a species because we're smart. I mean, we are smart most, <clears throat> you know, as a species generally, but, but a lot of other species are smart too. The, the real thing that makes humans successful as a species is that we cooperate. Uh, and there, there are a lot of different aspects to this. Uh, one, one big part of, of, of our capacity for cooperation is that we have this we have this unique capacity that no other species, literally no, no other species has. Uh, we can form what philosophers call joint intentions. Literally, this just means that you and I can take up a common goal and we can work toward it together. Uh, and Michael Tomasello and others have done a lot of research showing that actually no other species can do this. No other species can form joint intentions together, uh, share a common goal and work toward uh, and work in pursuit of it, something that children as early as 18 months of age can do. Um, and, you know, you can see this 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 cooperation, this pursuit of a common goal, you know, for example, in, in the, the rapid development of, of the vaccine, as, as Pier Giorgio was talking about, which is a hugely cooperative endeavor involving many, many people Uh, forming their minds a common goal and working, uh, you know, assiduously toward this common goal. Um, now, this cooperation can also actually be seen when we look at one of humanity's greatest assets, which is our, our cumulative culture, the rapid growth of knowledge uh, from one generation to the next. Now, why is, is, is the growth of knowledge an inherently cooperative task? Well, I mean, it's impossible for us to pass all of knowledge down to each individual person. There's too much knowledge. So when a job is too big for one person, we create a division of labor. And that's what we've done with knowledge. We've created what you might call a cognitive division of labor. Different people specialize in different areas of knowledge and society functions because each um, expertise has its own representatives. We rely on them to be keepers of knowledge in their respective fields. So we have, you know, virologists and epidemiologists, and we have uh, different kinds of engineers and scientists and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're the the keepers of knowledge in their specific disciplines. Uh, and it's, it's curious how many thinkers have failed to understand how important cooperation is to human thought and action. And you see this among uh, philosophers, for example. Philosophers in the West have often modeled human knowledge as an individual possession rather than as something that's distributed across society. And also philosophers have often understood rationality as something that's very individual as well. When we talk about what's the rational thing to do, philosophers often talk about what's the rational thing for an individual person to do, rather than what's the most rational thing for this group of people to do cooperatively together. 
Uh, and it's not just philosophers or academics, it's entire societies, including, unfortunately, my own, uh, the USA, uh, which operate without a proper appreciation for how interdependent we are uh, and how a choice of rational strategy is made as a group uh, and how the proper operation of society requires, for example, a cognitive <laughs> division of labor and a proper reliance on uh, expert voices. And, and I think this is what the pandemic has really made clear. The pandemic has made clear the individualistic conceptions of knowledge and rationality. So, you know, you look at countries like my own, countries like the United States, uh, people didn't think cooperatively or not enough people thought cooperatively. So instead mm -hmm. of thinking, you know, instead of cooperatively pursuing a shared goal, you know, as the, as the people, you know, developing the, the, the vaccine did. So instead of cooperatively pursuing a shared goal, slowing the spread of COVID, uh, a lot of people instead chose to act individualistically. And they pursued their own private preferences. So they refused to mask. They refused to social distance. Uh, also, a lot of people did not respect the cognitive division of labor. Uh, they did not recognize that expertise about the pandemic is located elsewhere in society. And so they did not defer to knowledgeable parties. Uh, and so lacking the proper information, you know, misinformation <laughs> and disinformation has been a huge, huge problem. Uh, in, in the pandemic. So lacking the proper information, these individuals who didn't respect the cognitive division of labor, they refused vaccinations, they didn't wear masks, they didn't take other protective measures. And we can see the consequences of this, you know, again, taking the US as, as an example where this individualistic thinking is dominated, we just crossed the million death threshold, uh, totally unnecessary. Uh, the vaccine continues to spread, it continues to mutate unhindered, which of course harms everybody not just the people who are thinking individualistically. Yeah. Uh, so we see very easily the results of, of people thinking individualistic <laughs> rather than rather than cooperatively. Um, and so this is the lesson I think that we need to learn or relearn, the, the, the lesson of our radical interdependence, the myth of individualism. We only succeed to the extent that we cooperate, and this cooperation includes proper participation in the cognitive division of labor, which means deferring to experts on issues like public health. We can't talk about or we shouldn't talk about isolated individuals because that's not how in people live in actual human societies, at least not any society that wants to survive more than a generation. And so what this means is the philosophical lesson of the pandemic is that we need to relearn uh, the value of cooperation and the value of community. And I would say that's the big philosophical lesson that needs to come out of the pandemic. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, Professor Mella, please. State. Yes, uh, I um, I'd like to 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 add uh, four points to what has just been said by the two uh, colleagues. Uh, um, the point about polarization in the public debate, uh, also a point that is most interesting for me about uh, philosophy of law, then something about uh, the perception of the risk and the philosophy of risk, and uh, then about temporality in these uh, pandemics. Um, polarization is not what is uh, the most interesting for, for me, although it dominated the public debate and also the philosophical debate. We all have read what uh, Agambem or Chichek have uh, written on that on the other side. So we all know the, the bestseller from the early months of the pandemics, the, the Great Reset also from the historian of the economics, uh, Adam Tooze, uh, not a support, but he sees chances in this uh, uh, chance, or uh, to quote philosophers, uh, there's a French philosopher, uh, Jean-Pierre Dupuis, who is who has, who are very uh, 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 engaged in the, in the opposite side of, um, of Agamben and, uh, and Dupuis. It's uh, frightening, how polarized the public debate is, but it's not, um, uh, uh, the most important part is not about philosophers. We do not influence as much people as we would like, as we may think. Uh, so it's more about society that, but I, uh, my perception is that society in the last years was becoming, increase, was increasingly authoritarian and uh, and with the potential violence that it may develop. Anyway, the second point seems to me more interesting because 
uh, it appeared uh, and um, it was it has been perceived in a more most dramatic way as uh, uh, we talked here in Europe in uh, in Germany uh, particularly and triage it uh, and we practice practice that it's not only that uh, in some cases we considered whether this or that COVID patient uh, should uh, had a uh, a lower uh, life expectancy, uh, uh, but also that many operations have been postponed, for instance, heart op uh, operations. So obviously uh, one had to balance uh, and uh, also to balance the, the right to life, which is a human right, and other human rights that are uh, about, for instance, subsistence. And uh, I have full understanding that not not only on most, not most dramatically in Europe, but also in other countries, the economic and social consequences, the, the job market, for instance, are very important and the worries of the people. And what the people maybe perceive or what, uh, and what we should uh, address and, uh, and analyze what the people may not formulate in the correct way is that all the human rights have priority over all other rights uh, they are uh, no no human rights is absolute, and uh, we perceive that um, at uh, um, at uh, well uh, at least when it is about resources for the implementation of human rights. So how do we allocate resources? And here I share the the classic view. Um, formulated by John Rhodes, which is that uh, there we should equally each people should have uh, be entitled to the uh, to the broader uh, scope of uh, basic uh, rights uh, as possible, but uh, it is not to be formulated in absolute way. And in the case of necessity, we know that uh, uh, the uh, that that. Uh, uh, that the scope of human rights is uh, must unfortunately be restricted. Uh, the third thing, the third point I, I, I mentioned is about the perception of the risk. Uh, we all know as philosophers what future contingents are, and you address bad prophecies. And of course, uh, we are glad uh, when bad prophecies do not happen. And we were very lucky, as you mentioned, that vaccination arrived in a very, very speed way. It was lucky, it was improbable. You talked about, um, the colleague Donatelli talked about the super success. It was, and then uh, um, afterwards, uh, which we are inclined to think, well, so that was not that uh, that dramatic, uh, but it could have been. So, and it's uh, something that is very abstract and good. So, but it means that we need abstraction, but it means that the perception may be another in the in the public uh, debate. So, dealing with contra counterfactuals is not easy, and even for many colleagues in philosophy that are not used to uh, the assessment, uh, to the philosophy of the assessment of risks. And the last point is about, my last point is about temporality, the perception of temporality. Uh, um, because uh, at the beginning, nobody took that as seriously as it should have been. It has been mentioned that uh, that disease developed dramatically. At the end of, of the 70s, we believed uh, infectious diseases were over. Uh, and now uh, more than 90% of the viruses that we have now didn't exist in the, uh, the early 80s. Uh, and that for many cases because of uh, zoonosis. Um, uh, yesterday there was something about uh, monkey, um, uh, monkey pox and that's 10% mortality. So uh, it was not a question whether it would happen, but when it would happen and we are quite lucky that it did not happen more dramatically. But at the beginning of the pandemic, it's not, uh, um, many people put the blame on the WHO, but also uh, even in Germany, which is, uh, uh, we, uh, in the first month, it was, you should not 
wear a mask. It was America. Uh, it was not like Sweden. So, and many people, uh, many politics were neither very, very straight, like the China's politics became, nor very, very uh, smooth, like the Swedish politics was, but like a kind of yo-yo and uh, among two things. And in the pandemics, beginning at the, the very early beginning, that's the decisive point. And afterwards, activism is of secondary significance. And uh, the, we have we we um, we uh, forget uh, pandemics very early. It's not only like uh, in the in the in the novel by Albert Camus, the plague at the beginning, uh, the beginning and the uh, and the story everybody knows, but the end uh, everybody forgets. At the end, it is the plague is forgotten very very quickly. And in fact, after World War I, there were not less victims of the Spanish flu than of the war. But what we keep in the perception is what human beings made of them, because uh, we had, after World War I, we had a dramatic increase of, on the one hand, pacifism, and on the other hand, bellicism and exaltation of violence. That, what, that is what we kept in mind, or what leads to the Second World War. Um, and we just have forgotten Spanish flu. Uh, so, and we may uh, we may um, uh, downgrade uh, the the long term consequences on climate. I, I mentioned zoonoses uh, and uh, the economics and the social consequences, the, psych uh, the psychological consequences, and that's uh, what worries me the the most. This wrong, this temporality. We are always wrong with. Uh, or most of us are always wrong uh, with uh, with um, with temporality with what with with what is happening. Uh, and something is sure that there are many factors of catastrophe. And uh, it, it's not bad that there are bad prophets, and that's even better that they are wrong. Uh, it, it just means their role is that they motivate to take action in order what they prophesize never happens. And I wish we we should learn, but I'm very pessimistic about the capacity to learn. We can evolve, but learn, we can learn that uh, we do that in a more limited uh, way. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Stefan Sogner, please. Thank you. Um, the central issue, um, which actually seems to combine the various crises we're currently facing all seem to have to do with the meaning of digital data. How do we treat digital data? How do we use digital data? And they, they are related to the coronavirus pandemic. And I think the coronavirus pandemic actually made us aware of the meaning and the relevance of how we treat, how we deal, how we collect digital data. But it also got to do with, with other like geopolitical questions, issues, military issues concerning the various massive powers, but also concerning... Um, the climate crisis. Um, one of the central philosophical issues is the connection between, between privacy and freedom. That was something Harari, right at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, stressed. And, and he, he, highlighted, or he, he highlighted that there's this direct connection between, between privacy and freedom. If we give up upon privacy, we directly have to lose freedom too. And I think he's completely wrong on that issue. And this is the important thing. We can keep, we can keep freedom, um, even, even, though, even though we give up on digital privacy entirely. And I think this is, this is one of the central issues. How, how do we, is, is there actually that connection between privacy and freedom? What's the appropriate connection between these two philosophical concepts? And in order to reflect upon that further, we need to consider what are the philosophical justifications for privacy? Why do we cherish privacy in the first place? And there are two major justifications. And one of them is the sanction theory of privacy. The other justification is the intellectual proper, property theory of privacy. Um, the sanction theory is basically sort of if digital data um, of uh, our digital data gets collected, um, some the person who has access to all that data could use it 
as as a means to sanction the individual to go against her. So if if it comes out that someone's murdering another person and raping another person, then then the person you know who's who's committed the crimes, then the person can get sanctions because this, the data is available. And it's good actually in these circumstances that the person gets sanctioned um, because they've committed a, a, a crime. The very um, many many people have, and that's why they connect freedom and, and privacy, is there are many acts which, which might not be worthy of being punished, but which might not be seen as, might not be morally approved in, in a wider social circumstances. For example, um, if people live in a polyamorous relationship, um, that, that is a perfectly, you know, this is, this is, um, this is l legally legitimate. But maybe if the issue comes out and, and it, there's a possibility of the people who have access to this digital information that, you know, people live in a polyamorous relationship, then they might blackmail them because it might not be approved in certain social circumstances or it might not be approved by, by you know, by the institution they work for. So that's one of the one of the issues why there seems to be a connection between freedom and privacy. However, um, um, this just shows that Maybe we don't have enough freedom. We don't have enough embrace plurality in a sufficiently strong manner, because um, um, in the way that you know, such things as also incest among among uh, among consenting adults is something which is even illegal in Germany, but it's, it's not illegal in, in Spain, for example. Um, Again, we have an issue here. People might be might be judged for something which they maybe shouldn't be judged for. In even they might even have to face a prison sentence. So there doesn't seem to be a sufficient amount of freedom. If we increase plurality, if we increase negative freedom even further, then the issue, the sanctions area of privacy, might not might not be too fearsome. We, we might not be worthy of of being reasons for. Um, for fearing for fearing the loss of privacy another issue was is is the um, is the intellectual property theory and the intellectual property theory has to do basically with well it's it's an um, our digital data is an extension of ourselves sort of going back to the Lockean proper theory and we work we combine ourselves with something external and therefore we acquire property and sort of our uh, our digital data is sort of our intellectual property and sort of if if the government or if any institution co um, collects all the data then they expropriate us then they take away our property which they shouldn't do and i think here it's it's this issue is the one which we which could enable us to rethink the meaning of digital data and and that comes down to the importance actually of cooperation which was which was which was stressed early on um Because I think the important factor to be is in whose interest is, is sort of this digital data which collected. And here we see the various, various ways of dealing with it in the world. In, in, in China, it's sort of the authoritarian solution. That's why we all fear the loss of digital privacy. So here, the digital data is being collected by, by the government and it's used in order to affirm, well, a, a, an authoritarian state which is not which doesn't, doesn't correspond with the achievements of the Enlightenment, which we don't want. We don't share the norms and values which are being affirmed in, in China. But it's ex extremely effective because they managed to get hold of enormous amount of digital data, which they, and data is in new oil. And that's, it's, it's enormously important for many different circumstances. And we underestimate, we in Europe underestimate the relevance of the digital data. And that's why I think we need to rethink the, its meanings. On the other hand, we have the U.S. American solution. In, in, in the United States, um, it's basically Facebook and, um, and Google who collect the data, and, and they're using it for their own financial benefit. Um, and we are sort of the workers um, um, by using We think it's free goodies, but actually we are the workers. And, and it's, it, in the end, we only maximize the financial game of these big, big, big companies. And in, in, in Europe, the solution is, is absolutely is absolutely stupid because it goes against the interests um, of of our, of the uh, of our interests, our democratic interests, um, because we cherish privacy. We make 
data collection extremely difficult. And therefore, we don't realize the power and the potential which goes along with, with, with digital data. And that might actually undermine our most, most central um, our most central interest, because in the end, sort of United States, China is getting richer. In the end, sort of here, the, the, the middle class will first realize um, the impact of not of the lack of economic flourishing as, as it's so difficult to collect digital data here. And that might, in the end, you know, once a certain group is financially less well off, that will affect them. That, and they will look for scapegoats. It's escape codes are minority groups, my, uh, refugees, the weak, the weak other in general, and that will lead to tension in a society and may, might even lead to civil war. Because we can't afford what we're used to, we are worse off um, uh, with respect to our financial well-being than, than in other countries. So here, I think we should rethink the meaning of digital data in the sense of you no, know, instead of if if the government, maybe European government, collects all the data. It's not an expropriation. They are not taking away our, our, our property, our intellectual property. Um, but it should be understood as a, as, a, as a payment, as a payment for something which we want. And what do we want? We want public health insurance. We want an increased health fund. This is what more, you know, the majority of people identify with a good life in some way, intrinsically, instrumentally. Live, being healthy is, is in some way important to us. And the public health insurance is an enormously wonderful achievement. I've got many students coming over from the United States because they can't take out a health insurance because they've got medical preconditions. Um, so it's, it's our wonderful achievements, but it, in, in, in Europe and, but it's extremely costly. So if we, if the, if the digital data was collected by the European, by European government, then obviously it needs to be, the data needs to be stored and well protected, maybe primarily processed by algorithms in order to avoid that individuals get access to the data. Um, and then the, the, then the data can be used for research purposes, for scientific research, biological, biotechnological research, policy making, for research, economics, social sciences. Um, and, and the finances, the money gains um, out of these, uh, 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 out of the usage of the uh, the um, of the digital data, can be used to finance our our public health insurance. So that wouldn't be that wouldn't be a, um, a, a expropriation, but it would be a usage. It would be in our interest, the democratic interest um, of, of the usage of digital data, and that's what I mean by rethinking the meaning of of, of digital data. And that has further implications. Just to briefly connect it. You know, um, um, the coronavirus pandemic with sort of the political, geopolitical issues. If, um, if, if, if it's correct, and many people, many economists, and so share that and said that data is in your oil. Obviously, data is not oil. Data is an intellectual property. Oil is a natural resource. But it's both connected to power, finance, financial well-being and flourishing. If this is actually the case, then that this is implications, geopolitical implications. Because so far, it's the most efficient way of collecting digital data is being undertaken by China. Inside China, it's only them who've got the right to access the data because there's a Chinese firewall. Outside, they're using Alibaba, they're using Huawei and TikTok to collect the data. And they get so much data. And the data is being used for, can be also for research. China has already overtaken the United States with respect to the amount of peer-reviewed publications, but that can be used for so many different purposes. That has financial implications. The richer a country the, is, the more money it gains in this way. And if, 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 if data is so important, it will gain enormous amount of um, uh, money in this way. It can also be invested for military purposes. So China, with the authoritarian regulations, will not only lead to economic flourishing, but also to military flourishing. China with the Silk Road expanding in, into Africa, investing a lot of money in, in various countries in Africa, will expand with their, with, their, with their political structures. So not collecting data as we do in Europe will have enormous consequences, not only for economic well-being, but also for our political system. Not collecting data... It doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's in our interest, but it will weaken the democratic system. And this is why we 
urgently need to rethink the meaning of digital data because otherwise it will lead to the flourishing of political institutions, authoritarian structures like in China. Thank you very much. This was an interesting statement. Okay, so uh, perhaps, uh, uh, well, okay, uh, I don't know, I should perhaps resume just uh, briefly. So, uh, uh, Pietro Donatelli, so to say, so stressed the point uh, of um, uh, say progress and cooperation. So he presented us a, so an optimistic, uh, say, so um, view of, of the situation. And uh, so he, uh, he focused also on this uh, achievement of, 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 of this cooperative uh, scientific effort that was also that also included to so, so openness in in in, in for example, in data exchange, yes, and, and also uh, um, putting uh, data in the public domain so that other people could uh, have no, or, uh, access to them without pro uh, problems. Um, so Professor Cohn's, uh, well, okay, he uh, somehow uh, continued this idea of, of cooperation, uh, and he somehow uh, um, addressed the problem that... Uh, by the fact, uh, the fact that we are say, so uh, cooperative beings, uh, from the individual point of, of view, uh, we are uh, somehow uh, we are reluctant, say so, to cooperate in every instance, to say so, yeah, because we have all say uh, private or individual uh, aims and so on and so forth. And in this, uh, I mean, uh, in this context, perhaps one should reflect on the role then of the state. Uh, in enforcing this kind of, of cooperativity and cooperation, especially in, in, in dear times like uh, like the pandemic. So uh, Professor Mel uh, addressed uh, 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 four points that have to do a little bit with, or more or less, uh, with the, um, say, uh, um, reception of the situation or the, uh, yeah, um, um, for example, the fact that uh, society has been polarized on on, on the topics that uh, somehow people thought that the human rights uh, have been uh, reduced or or so, and also he yeah, also addressed this uh, say so something that has to do a little bit with the human condition, the idea that uh, well something is not so important or can uh, somehow. Uh, cannot last so much that is we that we as humans have uh, we live more or less in the present and we project something in the future but not uh, uh, in the same say so strength in a sense as that is normally we hope that uh, good things would last forever and bad things somehow will be finished someday uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the in the in the short uh, future more or less yeah and Professor Zogner, this is, I found it very interesting, his uh, quite, uh, say, heretic concept, I would dare to say, but I, I am very fond of it. I like it. I like it. This idea that uh, we should uh, rethink our, uh, say so, relationship to this concept of, of, of data, digital data or other things. I mean, okay, today the data are collected in this uh, digital form, but they were collected always in, in other forms uh, before the digital form. Yeah, it's not so first, uh, say, so, uh, implementation of collect data. I mean, uh, there have been archives and I don't know what, you know, so registers, home offices, and so on and so forth, that collected data uh, during the most part of humanity, I think, I think since uh, there's a written history, so there's collecting of data about people yeah, and presenting them. But I think this is an interesting idea that we should rethink uh, uh, the digital data as something like a democratic value in democratic societies. And we should regard them in democratic society something like, say, uh, paying taxes. So it is, as we pay taxes to have material uh, welfare, then we pay, say, so data in, for, in order to enhance or to support this material welfare. So something like that. So which is, uh, as everything has, a, say, uh, a medium, an Aristotelian medium, it can be uh, abused. But uh, the other day of giving it up is not, is, is, is not a solution which is, uh, I think, a very interesting idea. Uh, it's a very interesting idea, and I think it's uh, worth of, um, say, let me, I think all this are worth of publicizing. Perhaps we should talk about it. I don't know. Okay. 
Um, I I don't know now. So the time is over. So officially has been, uh, and as I said, I have not so much time. I think perhaps we could uh, ask our uh, guests here if uh, they have a question. Uh, there have been some people who have uh, followed the uh, discussion all the time. And um, I think if you have a question, perhaps you should put it now because then in about four minutes, I'm going to close the session. Are there something, I think? Is there a question? No. Is there? No. Okay. Well, I think it's okay. So uh, I thank you very much for joining us. And I hope that people have something from this. I think it's going to be uh, recorded, so I, think, I don't know. It, it has to, it's, it's going to be made available to to the other uh, participants, uh, also to us. I don't know how it works. I would, I'm going to try it out, and I'm going to contact you after that. And uh, perhaps, uh, well, in this uh, point, we should also thank uh, Frank Jürgen Richter for inviting us unknowingly to to and, and putting us together. I, I enjoy to say so. A session. It's a pity that it was so short. I mean. Um, It's okay. We should have another, say, three quarters of an hour to discuss uh, all those topics, which were uh, very quite interesting. But anyway, I think perhaps it will happen in another time. And I'm very happy to uh, having uh, long you. Yeah. And so I'm going Thank to say you. goodbye now. Many thanks for Thank sharing you. this session. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So, bye.